Hey guys, wow, I am really shocked about this film. Today I'm going to be taking a look at the 2002 film Queen of the Damned. It has a 17% on the tomato meter and a 66% on the audience score. I don't know what to say. You know, I went into this to do a Rotten Review, and I'm still going to, and I pulled this up on Rotten Tomatoes and found a 66% on the audience score. Wow, I've got more than a page of notes here to argue uh, why this deserves an equally rotten score of perhaps 17% on that audience score. Now we have 259,787 audience reviews on this as of December 15th, 2019. I just cannot believe what I'm seeing here because I just watched this in the last three hours. Um, it's very fresh on my mind. How this has a not rotten score, certain 66%. What film are they, were they reviewing here? Um, okay, first of all, this film is so low budget and so cheap, and you can tell in the first three to four opening minutes of it how bad and cheap it is. And this is coming off of somebody who is a big fan of you know the Anne Rice vampire stories. Um, I saw you know I saw actually in the theater I saw an interview with a vampire with uh, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, and I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know anything about Anne Rice's novels didn't know anything about it. I had heard in passing that the movie was good uh, and I I heard that uh, the books were good. I went to see that movie in the theater and I was I was really impressed. I walked out of that theater uh, considering it at the time one of the best vampire movies I had ever seen um, and I've watched it two or three or more times on satellite and perhaps on DVD over the years and then Having been a big fan of that first movie, and then within two minutes of watching this one and anticipating it, that this was another uh, with the vampire Lestat, um, wow, I was just very disappointed. I almost wanted to shut it off. I was like considering this to be cringeworthy bad because... Um, you could have done the same exact plot, the same exact story. You could have done it well, just like that interview with the vampire. You could have made it a big blockbuster hit. It was a refreshing idea on what a vampire, uh, what Lestat, that type of character, would do if he you know, found himself in the modern world. Uh, it was fascinating. Um, the idea, the premise of it was fascinating. But what the hell that, that they did with this movie, um, wow, it just degenerated into a whole lot of nonsense. Uh, not only unexplainable nonsense, uh, illogical nonsense, but this was just flat out boring on top of it. I found myself wanting to fast forward through it. I didn't, but I wanted to. I really wanted to. Um, I just uh, I DVR'd this off of I believe one of the HBO channels, so I could fast forward and whatnot quite easily. And uh, wow, did I want to! But I didn't, and I took plenty of notes. And we're going to get right into these audience reviews because I just cannot believe I'm seeing these for the first time. Um, I just cannot believe what I'm seeing on that 66% audience score. Um, I was expecting to see like a 10% audience score. So this is going to be entertaining for me as well. We have a recent, uh, you know, one month old review right on the top uh, from November 10th of 2019. Two and a half stars. Two stars for the beautiful queen herself, Aliyah, who's barely in it but for her presence looms all over it. This new actor who played Lestat is fine. He's no Tom Cruise, but I get why he didn't return. The screenplay sucks. The entire thing is about his music career. And once it finally gets going with Aaliyah, she's gone like, why Hollywood, why? Miss you forever, baby girl. Well, this reviewer is referring to Aaliyah because she died in a tragic plane crash in the Everglades. Um, right after this movie was uh, finished in production, I believe. Um, but that was so long ago, you know, it's like I'm not going to rehash that whole thing. But yeah, she was tragically uh, cut short. 
And uh, her appearance in this movie was also something that uh, a lot of people were looking forward to because they saw the marketing, they saw the way she looked in it, and wow, it was very appealing to see her as a vampire. Um, this was not the movie's flaw at all. Sometimes in a movie you can say, well, casting an R&B singer of any type in a film or a musician is, you know, the fatal flaw. You put somebody in there that's not an actor. But no, that's not what the flaw was here at all. Um, this movie fundamentally fails in every other way. Number one being that it just feels like a low budget made for sci-fi channel cringe fest uh, right off the bat. And uh, we'll get into that. But if I had to give this a, a star rating, I would say um, half a star. I would say half a star because a movie was made and people got paid. But there's nothing redeemable here. The plot's illogical and fails. Uh, the budget's cheap. The sets are cheap. Um, there's unexplained nonsense happening and just not explained and hand waved away. Uh, the motivations of the characters don't make sense. Um, you know, it's just a huge list of stuff that I'm going to go through, but let's move through some audience reviews first. We have another one. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to skip the fanboy five star ones. Pointless. Let's get into this two star one from October 7th, 2019. Apparently, this vampire Lestat has been sleeping for hundreds of years because he's tired of being immortal, but decides to wake up because he hears the best band in history, Corn. The movie is basically just vampires doing vampire things to a Corn soundtrack. Yeah, pretty much. A um, little bit exaggerated. Uh, in the story, um, it's not really said why he wakes up you know at the end of the interview with a vampire he kind of uh goes to sleep or well he kind of wakes up at the end of that too for a little bit at the end of the movie uh but it's kind of shown in a way that you know he might just go back to sleep and skip a lot of skip out on our culture um but in this movie he wakes up for no discernible reason and he just uh the first group he comes into contact with are like a band like a corn type band they're playing in a rundown house which presumably is some house of his that you know it's it, i can't tell because it's a lot different than interview with a vampire the set's a lot different but it's kind of shown in the movie that this is his old neighborhood or something in new orleans and uh yeah, he comes across this garage band, and then instead of killing them, he decides that he appreciates their music and decides to become the front, the, the lead man, the lead singer of this group, and propel them to stardom. And then it kind of cuts away into the future, and he's this famous uh, rock star. And it's very weird the way it's done. It's very cheap. They show a montage kind of to corn music about him becoming, you know, the band becoming famous in MTV fashion. And, you know, this film is filmed in 2002. And even by 2002, MTV was kind of um, faded away. It wasn't a music video channel anymore. But in this movie, it shows it as a music video channel, almost like it's in the 80s. And I don't know, I didn't read the um, book from Anne Rice, how that story goes, but everything about this movie feels like it's supposed to be in the 80s. Uh, the type of rock music feels like something from the 80s. And the type of like the groupies, the rock uh, groupies that hang out around the band, the style of it, it feels like something that's like a forgotten period of the 1980s. And there are no cell phones. Um, um, you know, this is 2002, uh, the film was made, and you see nobody with a cell phone at all. Um, you see cars that are pretty much modern cars to 2002, but it feels very much, I had to ask m myself on several occasions whether this was supposed to be set in the 1980s, but it doesn't say that. But it feels that way in a lot of ways, particularly in the musical style and what they're showing with the MTV. But in any case, uh, let's move on to another uh, review here. Half a Star, uh, June 24th, 2019. I'm more offended as a Korn fan than as a moviegoer. They have Jonathan Davis write the soundtrack, sing the soundtrack. Then in the movie, that no-talent actor lip-sings to Jonathan Davis. All the actual Jonathan Davis is relegated to a bit role where he is a ticket scalper. On top of that, the movie was god-awful. Acting subpar, only good part was the music. I only gave it half a star because Rotten Tomatoes won't let me go lower. I kind of sympathize, sympathize with that person. They're a Korn fan, and yeah, there's a cameo by the singer of Korn. And there might be a cameo of the other members of the band, but I'm not a Korn fan, so I don't know what they look like. But yeah, it's clearly, it's just um, the actor, uh, Stuart Townsend, he plays Lestat. 
he's lip syncing and it's overly long. He does a big uh, stage performance where he sings um, songs as Lestat and it's too long. It's very too long and it's a, one of the reasons why this movie is boring. Um, the movie focuses way too much on stuff that just comes across as boring. And Stuart Townsend, when he first showed up as Lestat, you know, I wasn't expecting Tom Cruise, but wow, it's like watching a different character. Uh, it's not the same character. Stuart Townsend plays him completely differently, and he looks like he's doing a really bad job of it, and it's just cringy to look at it. It takes me like 30 minutes of watching him to even kind of believe that it's Lestat. And then what does it show Lestat doing? Well, it puts him in, you know, kind of a flashback sequence of... Uh, what he was doing, how he was made, the origin story of Lestat, and it's very cheap and it looks like it's done in a sci-fi channel way, almost like a Blood Rain type of cheap medieval set way, and it's got torches that magically light and all this stuff going on, and it's cringe-worthy bad and cheap, and you know, at one part, it, uh, at one point in the story, in this flashback, Lestat has just been made into a vampire, um, and the vampire that made him and him, they're both on this beach and there's a bunch of convenient uh, gypsies on the beach playing music. It's very cliched. And uh, Lestat just uh, finishes killing this uh, gypsy fisherman near all these boats on the beach. And then he gets a lecture from his uh, mentor, the vampire that made him, about how you can't just kill people. The vampires have to stay in the shadows, etc. And then they both just... Uh, you know, five minutes later, just slaughter some more gypsies on the beach. And instead of just leaving their bodies there, they think that by pouring whiskey or some kind of alcoholic beverage on the bodies and burning them on the beach, that somehow that keeps them incognito, as though villagers in that area wouldn't realize that these corpses had been ripped apart and then burned on the beach. Um, I guess they're thinking that if you just pour a bottle of rum over a body on the beach and light it on fire, that somehow it's going to turn it into ash or something and get rid of evidence. It's completely stupid. It's the logic of this movie. The logic fails at every turn and it's cheap on top of it. Um, you've got like, at one point in the film, you have a Superman ripoff scene. Uh, the 1978 Superman film had Superman taking Lois Lane on a flight where he holds her arm and takes her over Metropolis. And they do the same thing here with Lestat taking his love interest over Los Angeles to Griffith Observatory. And they do it in such a cheap way. They were too cheap in the budget to even have a green screen type budget. So they just kind of did a series of blurry movements and like had them like landing at Griffith Observatory. But it was meant to rip off the Superman thing where it's supposed to be romantic that he's taking her around. And you know, it almost reminds me of Twilight too. Uh, Stuart Townsend's portrayal of Lestat comes across in a lot of scenes as though he should have been in the Twilight movie series instead. It's really bad. And this was before Twilight. Before Twilight was even written, I believe. But yet, Stuart Townsend was the original uh, Edward of Twilight. That's how this comes across. Even the makeup on making him look pale as a vampire. He looks really pale and covered with pale makeup in some scenes and then other scenes. He looks more natural skin toned and fits in with other actors that aren't vampires. It makes no damn sense. It's worse than Twilight in that regard. Uh, but in any way, in any case, let's uh, continue on with some more rotten reviews. Um, we have three stars from June 2nd, 2019. It is worth a watch, but I don't see myself watching it again anytime soon. I thought the story was really good, but the ending was kind of a drag. It lacked more excitement. Saying it's the worst movie in existence is just not true. If you think this is bad, go watch Showgirls 2. Yeah, sure, Showgirls 2, I'm sure that's worse. Showgirls is probably on par with this or worse. Um, this movie fails in every way. The whole logic is ridiculous. There's so much stuff that's going on uh, that you don't know what the hell's going on. First, it's a story about Lestat waking up and wanting to be a rock singer. And his whole purpose in doing this is to make a big spectacle and supposedly draw out all the vampires out of hiding so that he can fight them or be the boss of them or expose them or something. It's not clear on what his end game is. He just wants to become a famous rock singer to bring all the vampires out of hiding. That's how it starts. And yet at the same time, there's another plot going on where his love interest is this 
woman who belongs to a society of vampire watchers. They're not vampire hunters. They're actually just like vampire watchers. They're almost like the watchers out of the Highlander series where there's some kind of society that stays in the shadows and they chronicle the vampires, but they don't actually interfere with anything. They're forbidden from interfering. Uh, what the purpose of this is, I don't know. They're supposed to just chronicle the vampires and what the vampires are doing. I have no idea. But in any case, um, this love interest of Lestat is a woman that belongs to these Watchers, and she is assigned to... Uh, you know, keep Lestat's lore, his uh, diary that he lost a long time ago, and his violin that he lost a long time ago, and she's just curating him for some regard. Uh, it's really weird. In any case, she decides to defy her boss and actually get involved with Lestat. It ends up almost like a Twilight story where she decides to become a vampire because she's so in love with Lestat. And at the same time, it's revealed later in the movie that not only is she just like one of the vampire watchers, but she was an orphan and she had a foster mother. And that foster mother is also a vampire that's related to Lestat. And they reveal this later on in the movie when it's way too late in the movie to make this connection. And what it has to do with anything, I don't know. But suddenly there's not only a vampire watcher girl that's a romance interest of Lestat, but there's this older woman who's now a vampire of her own regard, and she's been waiting in the shadows, and she's against Lestat. And at the same time, Lestat awakens this vampire queen played by Aaliyah, who's the queen of the damned, and she's like this ancient vampire who has created everybody in ancient times. She's this ancient Egyptian goddess whose bloodline is, you know, her bloodline, her vampire bloodline has flowed down through everybody else. And she's against everybody else, too. And there's so much complicated, convoluted shit going on. And it all stems. It's all mashed together, and none of it fits together. And it's boring. And, you know, it's entertaining watching Aaliyah play this ancient Egyptian vampire girl. But the stuff she does also makes no sense, and her motivations are also nonsensical. And the movie didn't have the budget to show the vampires flying around. So it did, like, helicopter footage and then sped it up really fast, and then added a shaky cam effect to it, too, on top of it. To, and that was supposed to represent vampires flying around, because they didn't have the budget to actually show them flying around. And then at other times, they had vampires doing vampire fights, you know, against humans, and, you know, vampires can move super fast, because they're like vampires, right? Well... The vampire superpowers, they're shown by um, just a blurry camera effect where the vampires vanish really quickly and move around with this blurry effect. And it's obvious, again, that the movie doesn't have a budget. They couldn't put CGI. They couldn't do anything. So they just showed the vampires, like, blurring in and out of existence. And that's how they appeared at super speed and whatnot. And it's really cringeworthy to watch it. Wow. Let's continue on. Um... November 16, 2018, one and a half stars, a queen of the damned seems to have been assembled using the discarded pieces of music videos and other movies. It's 100 minutes of MTV-inspired filmmaking with a metal soundtrack that would wake the dead and a video style that demands all sorts of filters, odd angles, quick cuts, and other assorted trickery. The plot doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It will confuse those who haven't read The Vampire Chronicles and will infuriate those who have because of the number of omissions and changes. I'll probably agree with that, but uh, saying it's one and a half stars is like one star too much. Let's take a look at my notes, and you know, these are kind of in chronological order following down. At the very beginning, I wrote that yes, Stuart Townsend, he sounds uh, and looks stupid as Lestat, okay? Uh, there's an opening narration by Stuart Townsend that kind of gives you like a backstory to what's going on. Uh, it's very cheap and stupid and like it's really bad. Stuart Townsend's just reading off a page and he's not acting and his voice sounds very incongruent with a horror movie of any type. It's completely cringeworthy. It's really bad. Um, yeah, when Stuart Townsend wakes up his vampire Lestat, He's shown carrying a violin and uh, the fiddle for a violin, uh, the bow for a violin, and he has this when he approaches this garage band in their house. 
Um, but at another point, it shows like that this Watcher Society has been curating the violin. The violin was in his tomb when he woke up. Like, okay, but the violin is still fine. He's been in the tomb for a, at least a century, and yet um, the violin, the strings all work, and the bow works, and he can play it just fine. And there's a whole lot of that that makes no sense chronologically and just physically, real-world physics, like... How does a violin that's been in a dusty tomb for a century, you can just start playing it, no problem. Um, I'm sorry, but it doesn't work like that. Uh, then what else did I write right after that? Um, yeah, the helicopter views with the shaky cam, that's your vampire flying effect. Um, yeah, the 1980s rock aesthetic. The rock costumes are like 1980s heavy metal type and... Uh, Everything looks like it's from the 1980s with the MTV uh, interview and all this kind of stuff. Even by 2002, this stuff looked old and dated. Uh, it's like the the story was supposed to take place in 1980, in the 1980s, but um, the movie chose not to say that it was. It doesn't make sense. You see modern cars for 2002. Um, yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, um, Vampires, well, okay, Lestat is made, it's his, a Lestat origin story, and, you know, we see um, how Lestat turns um, Brad Pitt's character into a vampire in Interview with a Vampire. That takes a while, it's a little bit of a process. However, in this movie, the whole process can take place in about one minute of time. You can become a vampire to have all your powers in like one minute. Um, very off-putting for anybody that's seen the first film. And, yeah, I would think that uh, whoever was a fan of the novels really found this offensive because I can't imagine that the novels would show this process occurring, like, in the span of 60 seconds. Yeah, so let's move through some more Rotten Reviews here. Oh, boy. Half a Star, October 27th, 2018. That anyone at all found this movie enjoyable is beyond me. This is by far the worst movie in existence. It took a wonderful story from a book and massacred it. I would wipe this movie from existence if I could. Well, there you go. That's somebody that's probably read one or more of the books. And um, they would find this very offensive, and I can see why. I didn't even read the books, and I'm offended just on being a fan of the first movie. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's let me tell you something else. Um, the Queen of the Damned character, the Queen, she's in uh, a tomb. She's like in statue form, and this movie kind of shows that vampires, when they decide to be tired of the world and tired of becoming a vampire, they can just kind of uh, turn themselves into statues. Sometimes they do it on their own, like the Queen of the Damned. She turned herself and her vampire queen, whom we don't see in the film except as a statue. They're both in this underground tomb area, um, and they're statues sitting in chairs. And when they feel like it, they can kind of animate themselves. And Lestat, or Lestat before he's, um, you know, right after he's turned into a vampire, he finds them underneath... Um, uh, his master's house on this island and he takes a bite out of the queen's stony arm and gets some of her ancient blood in him and she like animates herself enough to present her wrist to him and then she goes back into her statue pose again not explained in the film how or why this happens or what it has to do with anything and then um, there are a series of torches that kind of magically light themselves as Lestat goes into this tomb how exactly we don't know um i guess it's presumed that the vampire queen is lighting the torches for him to get him to go into the tomb but the movie doesn't say that but a lot of stuff going on in this movie that's not really explained it's unclear it's fuzzy and uh the movie just kind of i guess asks the audience to fill in the details yeah I don't really like plots like that. A lot of people don't. Uh, one and a half stars, August 13th, 2018. Another case of all style and no substance. Aside from the production design, there is nothing positive to say about this dull and pure cornball movie. Stuart Townsend is certainly better than the horribly miscast Tom Cruise in the film adaptation of Interview with the Vampire, but that is not saying much. He, is, he too comes off as totally goofy in the role of the iconic vampire. Not as much as Cruise, but still goofy as you can get. The same can be said for the late Aaliyah Houghton. She was not at all menacing. 
yeah, Aaliyah comes off as kind of like, I don't know, uh, in love with her appearance, but not really scary. More like a, a sexy vampire queen, but not a scary sexy vampire queen. Um, I don't know. All style and no substance. Certainly not scary. Um, just like somebody that wants to give you a visual um, visual look at like a sexy vampire queen. Not scary at all in the slightest. Um, one and a half stars. Well, they're saying it's because... Um, they're saying it's because Stuart Townsend came off as goofier than Tom Cruise. Well, I didn't think Tom Cruise came off as goofy, at least back in the day. Maybe now if I watched it, it might not age so well. But no, I thought uh, Stuart Townsend was just very off-putting as Lestat. He was more like a Twilight version of Lestat. He looked like he belonged in the Twilight film, uh, very much so. He could have played Edward in Twilight. So I'll agree with that. Two and a half stars, March 31st, 2018. It's so blatantly a full-length music video that's dated and full of nonsense, but it's so gloriously awful and fun. No, I disagree. It's not one of those so bad it's good movies. Um, there's nothing. It's too boring to laugh at. There's nothing to laugh at loud funny. It's just boring and cringy. And no, I'm sorry, I disagree. One star, not English. Two stars, September 21st, 2017. Apparently this vampire Lestat has been sleeping for hundreds of years because he's tired of being immortal, but he decides to wake up because he hears the best band in history, Korn. The movie is basically just vampires doing vampire things with a Korn soundtrack. I think I read that before, but it probably bears repeating. Let's move on. Uh, three stars, April 21st, 2017. I don't know, the acting was stilted and weird. Like they were trying to channel the goth classic The Hunger, but the story was pretty good. Yeah, it, to me it seemed like Twilight. Like it almost delved into a, especially when tu Stuart Townsend took his romance uh, girl to uh, the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles or outside Los Angeles. Uh, that's like when it became Twilight to me, except with worse effects. Uh, but very much like Twilight. Half a star, November 10th, 2016. Horrible, the only word to describe it. The books were amazing. This is a piece of crap. Yeah, one star, October 13th, 2016. Full of half-drawn characters and an undercooked plot. Uh, two stars, August 1st, 2016. Admittedly, the book is pretty hard to put into film. However, this film strips all of the beautiful and intimate complexity that made the book good. It's an embarrassment to Anne Rice that it has to be associated with her work. Well, I'll wonder if this isn't this movie adaptation isn't partly responsible for the little meltdown that Anne Rice had later on. Uh, it could have been. I know I wouldn't have wanted to see any book that I wrote uh, turn out like this. But let's see what my notes say. Um, yeah, you've got cheap blur effects for vampire effects. Um, you've got a scene in which um, Lestat. You know, all these vampires around the world know who he is, and they're planning on uh, killing him because they realize he's going to have this big concert in uh, the desert out in Southern California somewhere. That's what he wants to do. He wants to draw them all out so that uh, they can be exposed or something. I don't know what his plan is. It doesn't say. But, you know, everybody on Earth ought to know who he is by looking at him. He's the most famous uh, rock musician in the movie in the world that the movie shows. And yet he's able to go into this vampire nightclub and just hang out and drink at a table and nobody realizes who he is. Um, and even while he's in there, the vampires are remarking upon seeing him on TV that they need to kill him. Uh, but he's in there with them in the nightclub and everybody that goes into that nightclub gets checked at the door by security. It's shown in the movie, but nobody in there sees that they've got the most famous vampire rock star of all time just sitting there at a table in their club drinking a drink. And you know, that's the other funny part about the club. Um, it might show a drink on the table with Lestat, maybe, but nobody in the club is drinking at all. Like They're just like sitting there at the bar, but no drinks are in front of them, and they're sitting at tables and doing different things, and some of them might be dancing to music. Um, but they're in this nightclub and nobody has a drink in their hand or anything. That's kind of weird and I kind of wondered if that was another budget problem. Like they didn't have a budget to do anything so they couldn't put drinks in there or drinks in people's hands. I'm just wondering about that. It's kind of weird. Um, yeah. 
Um, why did the queen actually wake up? Uh, earlier I said that, you know, Lestat had awakened her, but not really. Um, she just kind of shows up. It's not really known why she shows up. She's shown in Lestat's origin story about how he drew some blood from her. But then later in the film, when he's trying to draw out all the vampires, it's not shown why the Queen of the Dam shows up. She was just a statue, like, long forgotten about before in the movie, and then all of a sudden she just needs to show up. Um, unexplained, and it's just a problem. Um, yeah, Townsend, he seems more suited for Twilight. Yes, there's that cheap Superman rip-off flight, but it, they didn't have the budget, so they couldn't really even rip it off properly. Um, yep, the Watcher girl, she has a surprise vampire foster mom, uh, and you don't know why, or, or why it even matters to the plot. Um, yeah, in the final showdown where you have Stuart Townsend's vampire, some other vampires, uh, the vampire foster mom, Stuart Townsend's uh, romance interest, uh, who has um, not been turned into a vampire yet. And you have the Queen of the Damned, Aaliyah, shows up. They're all in this epic showdown vampire fight, and you don't know what the hell's going on, what they're doing, or why they're there, basically. The movie just wants you to see them there. It kind of like just went through the motions to get them all into the same place. You don't even know where this place is or why it's relevant. Wow. And you see some really bad CGI where the vampire queen kind of has this metallic effect where she turns into copper or aluminum and then just turns into the swirling powder and dust and then it takes forever for this to happen. And um, it's just for the sake of showing off that they could do this CGI and it's just a CGI fest of her slowly, boringly transforming into dust after becoming metal. Very weird. Um, I was wondering what the point of it all was. Yeah, um, very long CGI death. And the vampire foster mom turns into a statue at the end. It's not shown why. She's just all of a sudden there's a statue of her standing there. She was like a living person or a vampire, a character. And then after the vampire queen has this long drawn out CGI process where she turns into metallic dust, all of a sudden when the camera goes back to the characters, that uh, woman is now just a statue of herself is standing there and she's presumably become a statue like uh, the Queen of the Damned was a statue originally. The movie doesn't attempt to explain the logic behind it or how it works or what process there was. It didn't even show her turning into a stone statue. All of a sudden they just replaced her with a stone statue and cut away and cut back to it and you could tell again they had the budget to show uh, the Queen of the Dam be becoming dust, but they didn't have enough money to show the other vampire lady becoming stone. It was obvious and bad. God, it was like so low budget, like so sci-fi channel-ish. Uh, half a star. After watching this movie, I'm convinced that the screenwriter's director didn't feel like faithfully adapting Anne Rice's story, so instead they just decided to tear out about a third of the book's pages, the ones that would have made the movie's plot make sense. Then they each took turns wiping their asses with the remaining two-thirds of the book before handing the mutilated, shit-stained corpse in the form of this awfully made movie to the audience, as you can probably gather from reading my review. Yeah, isn't it weird how this review that I just read is here, and there's a lot similar to it, and yet this still has a 63% on the audience score? What is going on here? I still haven't figured that out. Um, uh yeah, there's a lot of stuff I've already mentioned here. Um, so cheap, so low budget, so cringy, so just half-assed, and the acting is bad. Uh, the only thing worth seeing is uh, Aaliyah as the Queen of the Damned, and that's sexy and interesting to watch for the visual aspect of it, And but uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the movie. It really doesn't, and so let's move back to this page and just take a look at that 66% audience score. What the hell is happening here? What is happening here? If this were the other way around, I could say, well, critics found something weird to like in it, but who actually likes this thing? I don't know. Um, it's just, it's beyond my imagination. It really is. In fact, let me click on the more info. Yeah, 
3.67, three and a half stars, almost four stars. The average rating is almost is almost four stars. Um, wow, I just can't imagine. Are fans of the Twilight Show also fans of this because it kind of has some Twilight-like aspects of it? I'm gonna kind of guess that that has something to do with it. Uh, but in any case, the mystery remains, and I'm going to see you on the next episode of Rotten Reviews.